I'm John Spellman, and tonight we're going to be talking about the book of Acts and focusing on the lesson, You Will Be My Witnesses. Before we get started with anything, let's just begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bless us this evening as we study your word. We pray that you would guide us and to an understanding of mission and purpose. Uh, we pray that you would just remove all things which would distract and guide us, Lord, that we may be attuned to your, to your wisdom. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to start off by reading Acts chapter 1, verse 8, which says, you will, be, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We see that uh, Jesus resurrected uh, three days after he was... Uh, well, yeah, yeah, he, res he resurrected on the third day after he was um, crucified. So uh, he, he remained in the grave on the Sabbath, and he rose again early Sunday morning. And with his resurrection um, comes the fulfilling of many of his promises. And as he returns to heaven, he promises to send um, the Holy Spirit uh, back to earth to men uh, to be empowered to complete his work. So the gospel message wasn't entrusted to angels. It wasn't entrusted uh, to, to um, any other being, but was entrusted to human beings through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, there are two kinds of Messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. You have the ones that anticipate Jesus' um, kingly coming. So, in other words, uh, his, uh, you know, the great Messiah that everybody's been looking for, that will one day set all things right, that will teach all things, that will um, uh, you know, abolish the, um, the kingdoms of the earth and reign in righteousness. Uh, so this kingly Messiah uh, was anticipated and expected. And that was what Many of the Jews in Jesus' time were expecting Jesus to do. Uh, if Jesus had come in that manner, they would have been more likely to accept him because they wanted uh, this kingly Messiah to rid them of Roman rule. But the other prophecies talk about and predict that the Messiah would die for the sins of, of the people and um, that he would be the atonement made for sin. And that was something that Jesus came to do in his first uh, coming on earth that was not really appreciated by many of the religious leaders of his time. So let's take a look at a couple of the passages, and then we'll start, we'll start to understand the context of uh, first, first century Judaism and why Jesus was uh, not at first accepted by many, um, because their expectations were of something else. Let's take a look at Psalm chapter 89, verse 3 and 4, which says, I have made a covenant with, the, with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever. And build, up, and build up thy throne to all generations. Now we're going to go to the uh, same chapter, verse 35 to 37. Once have I sworn in my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon, and as, and as a faithful witness in heaven. We're going to go to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, which says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us Sorry, unto us the Son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David, and upon his kingdom, to order it, and, and to establish it with judgment and with justice, from henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Go to Ezekiel 37, verse 25. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever, and my servant David shall be their prince forever. Let's go to Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44. And in the days of those king, of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Now we're going to go to Daniel chapter 7, and uh, verse 13 and 14, which says, I saw, in my, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nation, and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which should not pass away, and his kingdom, that which, should not, which shall not be destroyed. So there you have all the passages which talk about this kingly Messiah who will reign forever and ever, who will rule forever and ever, who will never die, who will, whose kingdom will never cease to exist, 
uh, and who will uh, reign throughout eternity. Now let's take a look at the other uh, predictions about the Messiah, which seem at first as if they don't go along with this uh, kingly Messiah until you understand it in its proper context. So we're going to look at these other passages, which are Isaiah uh, chapter 52, verse 13, says, uh, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently, he shall, ex he shall be exalted and extolled, and be very high. As many were uh, astonished at, at the his visage was so marked more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations, the kings shall shut their mouths at him, for that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. I'm going to continue reading into chapter uh, 53. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For, the, for, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as the root out of a dry ground. He hath no form or comeliness, and when, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and, had, and, and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as, as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he, was, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul, and, and shall be satisfied by his, by his knowledge. Shall, shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he, and, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. So from these passages, you see that this uh, Messiah figure that's, that's uh, predicted here in, in Isaiah chapter 52 through 53 is someone who's going to go through suffering, somebody who's going to bear the iniquity of many, somebody who's going to be esteemed as if he were stricken or, or, or smitten of God, someone who goes through suffering, through, through uh, torment, uh, and so that was somebody that they would that many of the Jews did not expect would be this kingly Messiah. Uh, so they they kind of separated these two figures in their mind and did not uh, expect the Messiah that was going to go through suffering and pain and death and bear the sin of many. Uh, Daniel chapter nine verse twenty six says, "And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince shall come th uh, that shall come shall destroy the city." and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. So there you see that the Messiah would be cut off, uh, but, uh, but not for himself. So from all these passages, we see that uh, the Messiah was first to suffer before he became uh, this kingly figure that they were expecting. So both things were true about the Messiah. The Messiah wasn't going to be only the king or only the one who suffers, but rather both were true. Uh, but because the Jews in the first century were looking for a kingly Messiah, they ignored the passages which dealt with the suffering Messiah. Uh, and even as Jesus was on the cross and began to quote Psalms, um, it, which were describing the very things that they were doing in fulfillment of the prophecies, uh, they just were not getting it and understanding uh, what Jesus was doing for them. First would come, and of course reading this from a New Testament perspective, it seems a lot more clear to us. But Isaiah chapter uh, 53 makes it painfully clear that there's going to be this death of the Messiah, uh, suffering for a period of time, and then a resurrection, because he will prolong his days. Uh, and so after the prolonging of his days, does he become this 
kingly Messiah that everybody is, is expecting. Um, and so because he didn't come in the manner that people expected him to come, he was rejected by many. So there were two consecutive phases of the Messiah's ministry. First he was going to suffer, and then he would become king. And we read about that also in Luke chapter 17, verse 24, uh, 24 and 25, as well as uh, Luke chapter 24, verse 25 and 26, in which uh, it's made a little bit more clear. Uh, so first century Jewish uh, Messianic expectation was one-sided. They only wanted this obscure notion of a, of a Messiah who would, who, would, who would not suffer and die, uh, but who would um, be king, rather than this Messiah who was going to die on behalf of humanity. So if the Messiah was going to die, then they expected him to die only on behalf of the Jews. Uh, they expected him to be king only of the, of the Jews and to basically, uh, you know, perhaps wipe out all the other nations. But Jesus came to die not just for Jews, but also for all of humanity, uh, so that all human beings would have an opportunity to be saved simply through belief in him. And that's, that's a, a, a Messiah that many of the Jews were not expecting. So despite Jesus' warnings, um, even his own apostles could not fully understand what it was that he meant when he talked about dying and rising again. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, help the common to make a difference for people. In Jesus' name I pray, man. Okay, guide us. In Jesus' name I pray, man. Okay, so I was going to say that the, the Messiah that, that is important for us today is the, the, is, the, is the Messiah that suffered, died, and rose again the third day. And uh, mm -hmm. this Messiah is made atonement for sin and he's he did the perfect sacrifice the lamb of god who takes away the sin of the world but um i want to bring all the bible verses uh, bible verses but here about verse isaiah chapter 53 verse th 3 i think john you discussed some of this and he is despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and we hid as it were our faces from him he was despised and we did not esteem him. So he was despised and he was rejected by men, but he did that so that he could save us. And he was the perfect Messiah. He was the perfect Messiah yeah. to save <clears throat> That He can save anyone, no matter what you've done, no matter how far you've gone, he can save you if you repent and fully believe. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Andrew. So what's interesting about this is that not even Jesus' own apostles understood him fully. And even after the resurrection, we see evidence that they still didn't fully get it and what Jesus was, was, was seeking to accomplish. Uh, so when you look at Acts chapter 1, verse 6, for example, it says, When they therefore came together, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time again, uh, re sorry, restore again the kingdom to Israel? So even at this point, even after the resurrection, they still didn't get it, and they're asking Jesus, "Okay, are you going to set up the the kingdom now? At uh, you know, in in um, in, in Israel, uh, is all you know, is everything going to be restored to the way it was before? Only now we have this earthly kingly Messiah." They were expecting um, Jesus to restore a physical earthly kingdom in a specific region, and that is something that only God knows. And, and governs and is not and is not revealed to men in terms of in terms of when it's going to take place, um, and so, you know, again, their expectations are somewhat uh, limited in the fact that they're looking for a, a, a kingly Messiah in a specific region rather than the fact that Jesus would establish this kingdom throughout the whole world. Because when you look at Daniel chapter two, when we have the stone cut without hands that smites the image on the feet, um, it becomes a great mountain which fills the whole earth. So Jesus wasn't establishing a kingdom that was going to be in a particular region or a particular place only to, um, you know, wipe out the Romans. That was like small compared to what he actually would accomplish in establishing an everlasting kingdom that would reign throughout the whole earth and include all peoples, nations, tongues, uh, and, and tribes. Uh, so he came to establish an everlasting kingdom, an all-encompassing kingdom, and in doing so, it wasn't just about becoming a king and, and using military force to get everybody in line. He was seeking to conquer hearts. And in seeking to conquer hearts, he wasn't going to use mili military force to do that. Instead, he used what uh, Paul calls the foolishness of preaching to win the hearts of humanity and to uh, have people converted. And in doing so, 
he establishes his kingdom on earth so that when he returns again and destroys all wickedness and sin, uh, he will set up an everlasting kingdom on earth and reign uh, you know, amongst all tribes, nations, and people. So their scope of what was going to take place is very limited in that they're asking Jesus to set up an earthly specific, uh, you know, uh, 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 an earthly kingdom in a specific location um, rather than what Jesus had actually intended to do. And Jesus responds, he doesn't actually directly um, answer their question. He doesn't say, yes, I'm going to do it now, or no, I'm not going to do it now. Instead, he responds by saying, it is not for you to know the times of, or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. So he, he doesn't directly tell them, yeah, it's going to happen now, or no, it's not going to happen now. Instead, he says, this is God's decision, um, essentially. Um, you know, it's, you're not, it's, you're not going to know the exact times or the exact uh, seasons when it's going to take place. It's going to happen, but you're not going to know when. This is something that God determines. This, this belongs to God. It doesn't belong to men. If Jesus' death represented a fatal blow to the disciples' hope, the resurrection certainly would have revived it. Uh, Jesus gave no direct answer uh, to their question. He left the issue unsettled while he reminded them that the time of God's actions belongs to God himself. But he did give them a specific task to do. He said, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all, and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So he, he basically tells them, I'm not going to tell you when I'm coming back and when I'm setting up this everlasting kingdom. Only the Father knows that. However, your job is to receive this power, and with this power comes a special mission, comes a special purpose. And that purpose is that you're going to preach the gospel. You're going to be witnesses for me of my death, burial, and resurrection. You're going to be witnesses of what, I, what I've accomplished on your behalf. And you're going to go to every place in the world with this message so that hearts can be one to me. That's essentially what he's saying here. So in this message... A couple of things are implied. First of all, they're going to receive a gift from God. They're going to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And with the Holy Spirit comes the power to carry out the mission that they would then be given. There's going to be this special endowment of the Holy Spirit in their, in their future, just like we're expecting the latter rain in our future. Um, there's going to be this special endowment of the Holy Spirit's power in order to accomplish this great work. We see that at the early stages of Jesus' ministry, after he was baptized uh, by John the Baptist, we see that he was anointed with the Holy Spirit. And after being anointed with the Holy Spirit, he then began his work of ministry for three and a half years. Now we see that for the apostles, once they received the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, um, they would be, be able to begin a special work. Now, this, this giving of the Holy Spirit is something that's special here. Because obviously, if the apostles had ability to work miracles and to do certain things while Jesus was with them, they did it through the Holy Spirit's power. Uh, so they were able to, you know, cast out devils or to heal the sick and so forth as Jesus was teaching them. So if they already had the Holy Spirit, then the question would be with would be well, what was happening at Pentecost? Uh, remember that the Holy Spirit did not remain with the disciples while he was on earth. Uh, and we see that all throughout the Old Testament as well, where people were, were at one time filled with the Holy Spirit, but that they needed to be filled again at some point in time in the future. Uh, for example, Samson is a great example where you see repeatedly the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, or the hand of the Lord was upon him. You see that with different uh, prophets, where the hand of the Lord or the Spirit of the Lord comes upon them. Um, you see that with um, you know, many of the prophets in the Old Testament, many of, uh, of the uh, um, you know, uh, Old Testament figures, uh, you know, Samson, I gave you an example of. Um, I'm thinking of uh, someone else. There's someone else I was, I was thinking of, but the name escapes me offhand. Uh, but anyway, you see all throughout the Old Testament that the Spirit of the Lord comes upon an individual, but he doesn't seem to remain there as we see that they're filled with the Spirit at another time. But however, when we look at the baptism of Jesus, Jesus was filled with the Spirit, but the Spirit of God was not given to Jesus with any measure. In other words... Jesus had an unlimited supply of the Holy Spirit's power. And the Holy Spirit was going to be poured out at Pentecost so that the apostles also would have this unlimited supply of the Holy Spirit and, and, be, able, and be able to be used by the Spirit of God to accomplish the work that they would be given. And that could not take place. The Holy Spirit could not remain with, with humanity 
until after Christ's exaltation in heaven. Once he was raised, uh, was raised up and ascended into heaven, then he was able to send the Holy Spirit uh, to dwell with humanity, and he would dwell with them and be in them. And this wasn't going to just be a temporary thing, but rather a continuous thing. Let's take a look at a couple of passages. It says here in John chapter 3, verse 34, For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. So this is Jesus referring to himself, and notice how the Spirit of God is not given, to, given by measure uh, for him. You'll notice, for example, like with Elijah and Elisha, that when, when Elijah ascended up into heaven, or as he was being carried up in the, in the chariots of fire, Elisha asked Elijah if he could have a double portion of his spirit. And Elijah says, if you see me when I ascend up into heaven, then it will be as you have asked, or as, as you have requested. And so Elijah had um, the Holy Spirit, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, but Elisha had a double portion of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we also see examples, for example, you know, like in Deuteronomy, where Moses um, is filled with the Holy Spirit, and God takes of some of the Spirit that is upon Moses and gives it to others uh, who would then prophesy after that was done. So, from many of these passages, we can see that pe people in the Old Testament were given measures of the Holy Spirit. They weren't, you know, they weren't completely filled with the Holy Spirit. In some cases, maybe one individual here or there might have been might have been filled but did not remain filled. They needed to be filled at another time or given of the Holy Spirit. However, with Jesus, we see that things are different. When Jesus is baptized, we, we learn that he, was, he receives not the Spirit. God didn't give him the Spirit by any measure, but he, re, he completely received the Holy Spirit. And so he has an unlimited supply of the Holy Spirit, the third person in the Godhead. And at Pentecost, the promise was that the apostles would receive the Holy Ghost. And so they would, they would receive this special uh, anointing of the Holy Spirit uh, in which um, they would have an unlimited supply of his power, just as Jesus did. And this could not happen if Jesus did not ascend. So notice what the passage says here. In John chapter 16, verse uh, 7, he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. It was crucial that Jesus die and, and rise again, because without Jesus ascending up into heaven, the Holy Spirit could not dwell, continue to dwell with humanity. Because humanity is sinful, and we know that um, uh, Isaiah chapter 59 verse 2 tells us, For your iniquities have separated between you and your God, your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So sin separates humanity from God. We also see that in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, which says, For my spirit will not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. So the spirit of God cannot continue to dwell with sinful humanity. There comes a point at which uh, humanity can grieve away the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit can no longer continue to plead and, and, and to dwell with humanity. So... Throughout time, we've seen that people have had interactions with the Holy Spirit, but never to the extent where he continuously dwell within the individual. Um, we see, like, for a period of time, the Holy Spirit would remain with that person, and then at some other point in the future, that person would be filled again. In John chapter 14, verse 7, Jesus said, Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. So notice, notice what happens here. He says, The world cannot receive the Holy Spirit. Because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. So because of what Jesus accomplished, the Holy Spirit was going to dwell with, be with believers who accepted Jesus Christ. In verse 18 he says, I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. So Jesus, when he returned to heaven and was inaugurated, and, 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 and um, you know, he was exalted in heaven, he changed the status of humanity uh, in heaven. And this is all done at God's direction. So this isn't like he has to convince God to send us the Holy Spirit, or he has to convince the Spirit to come and dwell with us. This is all legal th uh, things that are taking place in, in the kingdom that God initiated. So this is all things that are taking place. Basically, Jesus obtained the right 
to send us the whole, to, to legally send us the Holy Spirit so that we can be filled with his presence and with his power. And so when he ascended up into heaven, um, having accomplished what he did on earth, the Holy Spirit could then be sent to those who accept Jesus and could dwell with them. Uh, and and you know, an argument could not be made against it, saying, oh, well, these are sinful people, because Jesus' death covered their sins and provided reconciliation between uh, humanity and divinity. And with that reconciliation in place, the Holy Spirit is then free to dwell with humanity, and it's essentially like the down payment or the earnest of our salvation in Christ. Uh, there's another passage which I think makes that even clearer. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 says, uh, In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after, ye, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest, or down payment, of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 22 says, Who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in, in our hearts, or in other words, the down payment of the Spirit in our hearts. So in other words, now that our legal status is, is, is changed in the eyes of heaven, we now have um, access to the Holy Spirit and to his presence, which would have been legally impossible beforehand. Um, so, now the Spirit can be received without measure. People can receive it, uh, the full outpouring of the Spirit, and that's what Jesus gave to the apostles at Pentecost. So that's what it's talking about here in regard to the gift of the Spirit. And this is something that was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 3. So if we look at Isaiah chapter 44, verse 3, the Bible says, For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and, and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my Spirit upon thy seed, and my blessing upon thine offspring. Then we go to Joel chapter 2, verse uh, 28 and 29. The Bible says, And it shall come to pass... Uh, afterward, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall see, shall, shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. So here we see that um, the spirit is going to be at work. People are going to be able to prophesy. And this wasn't something that was only true for the apostles' time, but we're also going to see the latter rain outpouring of the Holy Spirit in uh, the end of time. Uh, secondly, we have the role of witness that's uh, talked about here in Acts chapter one, verse eight. Uh, so they weren't just given the Holy Spirit for decorations, you know. You don't just have the presence of the Holy Spirit uh, just for the fellowship and for and just for the sake of hanging out, just to say I have Him. Uh, he's here. He's at my house, or He's in my life. He's in my heart. It's not just for the purpose of having Him present, but it's for the purpose of accomplishing the gospel mission. So if one is praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit you're basically asking to take part in the mission of Christ. So the two go hand in hand. The Holy Spirit empowers a person in order to accomplish a mission. Third uh, is, of course, the mission itself, the plan of the mission. And this was a progressive plan. They were to begin in Jerusalem, they were to go out to Judea and Samaria, and then also to the neighboring areas, and eventually out to the whole world, to the uttermost parts of the world. Fourth, um, they received the orientation of the mission in Acts 1, verse 8. Um, so in Old Testament times, it was supposed to be that the nations were to be attracted to God and come to Jerusalem. But now the people were going out from Jerusalem and uh, preaching to the uttermost parts of the earth. So it's a different strategy than what we saw in the Old Testament. Uh, Jerusalem was still going to be the center, the centerpiece, but instead of everybody coming to Jerusalem, people were going out from Jerusalem. That's why it says, uh, out of Zion shall come forth the law, the word, of the, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, because it's going out from Jerusalem to the uttermost parts of the earth. Okay? Uh, let me go ahead and grab the comment coming in. You are on the air. Hello, John. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, I want to greet everyone in the name of the Lord that... Uh, Hopefully we find the peace of God before time's up and before our time is up. Um, but I want to bring out the point that um, this is interesting, John. You were touching on Joel chapter 2. And I, I saw this just while you were speaking that um, Joel chapter 2 verse 
29, and also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I'll pour out my spirit in those days. And mm -hmm. quote New King James Version. And then verse 30, and then it says, And I'll show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Right. Verse 31, part way down, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. End quote, New King James Version. So obviously there's going to be an outpouring of a, the Holy Spirit in a special no, way that leads to perfection of character, that leads to fulfilling the divine commission, the great commission that God gives a, give, give to him, to his people. And it's also going to, um, it's going, it's going to bring in the second coming. It's going to bring in the second coming. And this is all going to be accomplished to the Holy Spirit, the powerful Holy Spirit that is poured out. And, it, and, and like John, I agree with, with what you were saying. We should continuously ask for it because uh, not all the times that we can because it's a relationship. We ask for God's things and we, we, we ask for, especially for the Holy Spirit, hopefully. And he gives it to us and we thank him and we praise him. And there's something to be, God is worthy to be praised. And worthy, worthy to be thanked. Thank you, Andrew. Yes, he is worthy to be praised. And we see that he's accomplished so much for us. Even the fact that we can have the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, And we also need to understand you know, the Holy Spirit is a person. So we're asking for a person to come into our lives uh, to dwell with us, to, um, you know, to, to empower us. Uh, and, and, to, and, we, and, and in doing so, we take part in his mission. And so, you know, if we're, if we're truly connected with the Spirit, uh, we agree to be a part of his mission. We become uh, co-laborers with Christ. Uh, let's go to Luke chapter 24. We're going to look at verses 44 to 48. Which says, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law, of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Uh, then opened he their understanding, talking about the apostles, he opened their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. So, the apostles were given a specific mission. They were to preach repentance and remission of sins. Now, repentance and remission of sins is something that you don't really hear. Well, you hear maybe remission of sins, but you don't hear people talking about repenting very much these days. You know, these days it's all about, you know, maybe perhaps uh, the love and, you know, things like that, but not uh, anything dealing with repentance. People are often scared of the topic of repentance because people, even though they want to be connected with Christ, they want to at least say that they're connected with Christ, but they don't want to give up sin. They don't want to repent. They don't want to give up the lifestyle. So, uh, you know, that, that of course becomes a contradiction to what the apostles were asked to preach here uh, as we look at verse 47 in particular. But in addition to that, they were to preach what they, what they actually had witnessed. Um, so he said, ye are witnesses of these things. So they were to preach what they knew. And what was it that they knew? They knew that Jesus Christ had to suffer, that he had to rise again the third day, and that uh, as a result, repentance and remission of sins could be preached in his name among all nations because God has provided uh, reconciliation uh, with the world. And so that's what the apostles were to preach. And he spent about, Jesus himself spent about 40 days with the disciples after his resurrection. So we look at Acts chapter 1, and verse 3, we see that after his resurrection, he spent some time teaching them exactly how they were supposed to witness. So it says in Acts chapter 1, verse 3, to whom also he showed himself... Actually, you know what? It might make sense if we um, read uh, verse 2 into 3. Until the day in which he was taken up, after that, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. To whom, these apostles... Also, he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the, of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So he had been seen by them for, for about forty days, and he taught them and used infallible proofs to show uh, that he was legit, that the prophecies of the Old Testament had come to pass and were fulfilled in him. 
So Jesus must have explained much truth to them about the kingdom of God, even if they, even if there was still uh, much they didn't understand, as we saw in Acts chapter one verse six. Uh, they were familiar with the prophecies, but but uh, could now see them in a new light. So Jesus revealed to them uh, more and more of the truth, so that they could be witnesses for him, and they would have infallible proofs to substantiate their claims. Let's take a look at Acts chapter 1, verse uh, 9 to 11. And when he had spoken these things, while, he, while they beheld him, sorry, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So from this passage, we see that it's going to, that uh, based on what the angels tell the disciples who watch Jesus ascend into heaven, we know that his return is going to be a literal return, because he, and he was taken up in a cloud, he was no longer seen and able to be seen, so the two angels that uh, you know that were that were present or remained as um, as as uh, two witnesses establishing the surety of his return in like manner. Now remember that scripture says that in in um, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall a thing be established. And so there were two witnesses present, two angels present, establishing the fact that the same Jesus that you saw ascend into heaven is going to come back in the exact same manner. So it's going to be a literal return. It's going to be a literal descend, and he is going to um, come in person. Not a representative, but Jesus himself. And that's why it says this same Jesus. In the uh, Greek, the term uh, aperthe is uh, used here in, in Acts chapter 1, verse 9, uh, where it says he was taken up. Um, that's the word that's used there. Uh, later in the text, it uses a different word uh, where it uses that phrase, taken up. So in Acts chapter 1, verse 9, where it says... Uh, he was taken up, a perthe is used, but in verse uh, 11, a different Greek word is used. But nevertheless, um, it's suggested that um, uh, when the term a perthe is used in the Old Testament, it uh, seems to be used in connection with something that God does himself. So that's just another evidence that shows us that uh, Jesus' return is going to be a personal return, a, and a literal return. His ascension was also visible, um, everybody who was present saw it, and so we can expect that his return will also be visible. visible. But uh, as we see in different passages of Scripture, it's going to be even more visible because he's coming with great power and great glory. So, for example, we see in Luke chapter 21, verse 27, that Jesus' return will be with power and great glory. Uh, in Revelation 1, verse 7, it says, And every eye will see him. So the glory of the second coming will far exceed that of the, of the ascension. So now the apostles have seen Jesus ascend into heaven, and now they're waiting in, in uh, you know, in, in uh, Jerusalem for power to come from on high to empower them uh, for their mission. So as we look at verses 12 to 14 of Acts chapter 1, the Bible says, Then they returned, then they, uh, then, then returned they unto Jerusalem, from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into, the, into an upper room, where both, both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and uh, Simon Zelotus, and Judas the brother of James, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brethren, that's actually fascinating, because remember that Jesus' brothers at first didn't believe in him. Uh, we've covered that in, in other lessons, but we know that um, you know Jesus' brothers kind of mocked at him and said, you know, if you nobody nobody who seeks to be known uh, doesn't show himself openly. So if you if you really do the things that everybody says you're doing, show yourself to the world. And and the scripture says that neither they uh, neither his brethren believe in him. Uh, but now we see that they're in the upper room praying and waiting for the Holy Spirit, which suggests that perhaps uh, in Jesus' 40 days of meeting people after his, after his resurrection, that chances are he must have met with his family. And now they are confronted with the reality that they know he died, they know he rose again, and so there's the reality of, okay, this is for real, what do we do now? And so they're in the upper room praying, 
And as we know later on, James, his brother, actually becomes uh, the bishop of Jerusalem and a, and, a, and a leader in the church. Which is amazing, considering the fact that originally his brothers didn't believe in him and were not any of his disciples. So they're praying on one accord, and um, verse... Uh, 15 tells us, And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said the number of, of the names together were about 120. So all these people who are gathered here in the upper room uh, equal out to be about 120 people that are praying and awaiting for the Holy Spirit. If we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7, After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. So this uh, James that's being talked about here in verse 7 is actually James, the brother of Jesus. So uh, that substantiates that he most likely appeared to his brothers, uh, and so now we see that they become believers, whereas before they doubted him. So that's another passage that sort of adds to it, uh, which substantiates that, uh, that they were together uh, with um, the other disciples in uh, the upper room in Jerusalem, awaiting the, the presence of the Holy Spirit. So this passage uh, is, is referring to, um, in that 40-day period when Jesus was walking around, uh, you know, meeting with people uh, that his family were included in the number of people that he met with. And uh, that's why we see his brothers uh, in, Acts cha in Acts chapter 1 meeting and praying with the other disciples. And James, of course, as I said before, becomes a church leader. So that's just another text that substantiates that. Another thing that we get from this passage in Acts is that the Holy Spirit comes in response to prayer. So immediately after they begin praying on one accord, we see that there's the sound of a mighty rushing wind, uh, we see that um, these cloven tongues of fire appear above their, their heads, and they're all filled with the Holy Spirit and begin to speak uh, in different languages uh, and begin to go out and witness to those who were from all different parts of the world. Um, so that takes place after they receive the power of the Holy Spirit, and they're now empowered for their mission. And of course, a prerequisite to the Holy Spirit's um, presence was this prayer in singleness of heart. So before uh, the Holy Spirit is poured out, um, another interesting thing is that uh, of that community of 120 believers, uh, they decide to choose a successor to Judas. So remember that Jesus had 12 apostles, but obviously Ju Judas had forfeited his position and later he hung himself after he betrayed Christ. And so now they're looking for someone to fill the position of, 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 of Judas uh, to be the 12th apostle uh, because now they're down to only 11. And so, uh, when we read this in Acts chapter 1, verse 21 and 22, which says, Wherefore of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So, in order to find a successor uh, to make the twelfth apostle, um, it had to be a person that was numbered am among the people present when Jesus visited them. Starting from, uh, and when I say visited with them, I mean by, in, in the time period that he, in which he was here on earth. Um, so, starting from the baptism of John to the ascension, um, such a person would, would be an effective witness, having seen what the other disciples had seen and been taught. So he wanted to choose a person who was among the group that had seen everything that everybody else had seen and would be a witness to. So it wasn't enough that a person would just, um, you know, be filled with the Spirit and get the title of Apostle to make the number of 12. They were choosing somebody specific that could have the same testimony that everybody else had. So they were choosing from a specific group of people. It's also interesting that in order to do it, um, they, after praying, they casted lots. So we read in verse 23 to 26, it says, And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabas, whose surname was Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest all the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that, they may, that, that, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. So there was a need for a witness of Jesus' resurrection because the, res the resurrection was the most powerful evidence of his messiahship. Um, and so it is the basis or establishment of the truth of the whole Christian faith. So they wanted a person who was a witness 
to the resurrection, who saw him crucified, who saw him resurrect, who saw you know his teachings and, and could testify to those things. And this was essential for uh, you know because it was foundational. And the person who's witnessing or testifying of these things needed to have some credibility. So they prayed and then they casted lots because they believed at that time that through casting lots, they were leaving the decision in the hand of God. If we take a look at Proverbs chapter 16, verse 33, you'll see it says here, The lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. So in other words, a person can choose to cast lots, but the outcome belongs to God. And so they believe that by casting lots, um, that God would make his, no his, his presence felt, God would make known uh, what his decision would be. So today, I mean, not that we cast lots, you don't see any examples of them casting lots after the Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost. Uh, but prior to that, it was used as a means by which to obtain God's will. When they received the Holy Spirit, uh, then they knew God's will because the Holy Spirit directly expressed it and made mention of what he wanted to do. Uh, but before that, they would cast lots and God would reveal uh, through, that, through, through those, um, those lots uh, what his will was. So essentially, if you're trying to understand what lots is, lots is essentially like, um, I wouldn't call it gambling per se, I would call it more like um, drawing straws. Uh, that's the same thing. That's what we use, or rock, paper, scissors. Um, because the outcome is by chance. And so they believe that God would direct the chances uh, to reveal his will in the outcome. So it's one thing for a person to just do a rock, paper, scissors to make a decision on something and leave it up to chance. But after praying, they wanted God to direct the outcome of a completely chance-based uh, outcome. And, and so by God intervening to cause the right lot to be cast, uh, he would be revealing his will and determining who the twelfth apostle would be. So that was the logic behind what they were doing. Um, but of course, after the Holy Spirit was poured out, there was no more need uh, to cast lots because they had the Holy Spirit directly telling them and influencing them with what he wanted. And we see several examples of that in Acts chapter 5, verse 3, Acts chapter 11, verse 15 to 18, Acts chapter 13, verse 2, and Acts chapter 16, verse 6 to 9. I'm, I'm not going to have time to read all those passages. But, um, you know, we, we see many instances in which the Holy Spirit revealed um, his will uh, directly. You know, for example, where he said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, uh, unto the work whereunto I have called them. Now think about this for a second. Um... Instead of having to cast lots to determine which of the apostles or which of the disciples were going to be sent to which location, instead the Holy Spirit speaks directly to them and says, Hey, I want Paul, I want Barnabas, send them here. Uh, we also see examples where the Holy Spirit forbade people from going to a, to a particular place to carry out their mission because that wasn't the place where he wanted them to go. So, he, so the Spirit would, would forbid them to go certain places, whereas he opened the door for them to go to other places. So now there is no more need to use a chance-based system in order for God to intervene and direct the path of those chances. Instead, they had direct uh, supervision and direct um, um, correspondence with God, which allowed them uh, to carry out the work. No more needing to leave it up to chance. See, we got a comment coming in. You are on the air. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. Go ahead. Thanks for having me on the program, John. I appreciate you. Uh, well, that um, Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. And that um, if we don't grieve this Holy Spirit, because we can grieve the Holy Spirit, as you're saying, John, the Holy Spirit is a person, and we can grieve him by sinning, by going our way, own way, by doing our own thing. By, uh, by sinning against God, doing the things that are bad. And we can hurt Jesus by doing that, hurt God the Father. We can hurt the Holy Spirit by doing that. But the thing is, is Jesus saves. And if we submit and commit our lives over to him every day, he'll live and he'll, live and he'll be a big, a full part of our life and we'll be saved in his kingdom by God's grace, by faith Amen. of Jesus, by faith of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Andrew. I do want to read a couple of these passages just to um, emphasize this point a little more. Uh, Acts chapter 5, verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost 
and keep back part of the price of the land. So here you see that the Holy Spirit could be lied to. Um, they, 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 and the Holy Spirit would reveal when somebody wasn't telling the truth and when uh, something wasn't right. So they had direct communication with the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 16, verse 6 to 9, the Bible says, Now when they had gone throughout uh, uh, Phrygia and the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they were come to Mycia, uh, they, uh, they essayed to go into uh, Bithynia, uh, but the Spirit suffered them not. And they, passing by Mysia, or Mysia, uh, came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night, there, there stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after, that, and after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering to, that, that the Lord had called us for, for to preach the gospel unto them. So notice here, again, you see that whether it's direct, through his direct voice or whether through a dream or a vision, the Holy Spirit was in direct communication with the apostles to tell them which direction he wanted them to go. I should also point out that uh, while there, there were 12 apostles uh, you know, in the upper room, and uh, Matthias eventually was chosen to uh, replace Judas, that later on, Paul is also called an apostle. So the, the apostles weren't limited to just those 12, but rather uh, there were other, you know, those 12 were foundational and were the main, like, leaders. Um, but uh, later we find that Paul claims apostleship just as much as any of the others. Uh, and that is substantiated. Now, he didn't have witness of the resurrection, or of um, the, you know, uh, um, you know, much of Jesus' ministry, like his baptism or his miracles and things of that nature. Um, but it, when he was stopped on the road to Damascus and he saw, uh, and he spoke to Jesus directly, um, he became a witness for Christ. Um, so the, the other apostles, for example, um, you know, Peter and many of the others, were witnesses in uh, Jerusalem and in Judea and in much of the... Um, uh, you know, and into much of the um, the Jewish nation, um, and so they could go and they could preach to other Jews. But Paul was uh, basically uh, sent to the Gentiles. Um, so even though um, he hadn't been walking with Jesus uh, during Jesus's three and a half year ministry while he was on Earth, um, he was essentially an apostle um, and could witness based on what he knew and what Jesus had revealed to him. The twelve had a particular mission which uh, Jesus gave them. Because they had seen, you know, because they had been with him throughout his ministry, because they had seen his death, they had seen his resurrection, they saw him ascended to heaven, uh, they could witness in one way. But Paul was called to reach another population. He was called to reach the Gentiles, and he was just as much an apostle as uh, all the others. In fact, uh, you know, in reference to himself, he uses a, uh, the, the term that he was one untimely born in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, verse 8. Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 9.1. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have, not I, have, have, have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? So here he, he, he uh, emphasizes that he too is an apostle. And even though he didn't see Jesus you know, that Sunday morning when he resurrected, he had seen Jesus when he was stopped on the road to Damascus and he was spoken to by him. So Matthias became one of the twelve, and I guess you could consider Paul perhaps, uh, you know, there were many disciples and many people who could claim the title of apostle, um, but I guess to make this a little bit clearer, uh, so only the 12 apostles and Paul, uh, were apostles in the technical authoritative sense, as we see in Acts chapter 1, verse 25 and 26. Yet in, in its basic sense, uh, or general sense rather, um, as envoys or messengers, the term also could be used for other gospel workers, as we saw in Acts chapter 14, verse 4, uh, verse 14, and Galatians chapter 1, verse 19. So the term uh, apostle could be used for somebody who was a messenger or an envoy uh, for Christ, and in the, the general sense, and it can include more people, but in terms of uh, the stricter sense, the authoritative sense, uh, it would refer to the twelve apostles and Paul. All right, so that's all the time that we have for tonight. Uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing in reading and studying your word. Help us, Lord, to carry forward the message of your gospel and to be witnesses for you. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming, everyone. Good night.